Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is the Home Observatory. And here to tell us how he accomplished all of that is our own Astronomy for Everyone team member, Sean Pickard. Sean, welcome to this side of the camera. Thanks, Don. It's great to be on this side now. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So um, if you could tell our uh, guests a little bit about your background in astronomy. Uh, sure. My mom took me and my brother to Astronomy at the Beach way back. It was probably the second Astronomy at the Beach that was ever held. Uh, and that was back when it was back at Kensington over there. And so I always had kind of an interest in astronomy and the stars and kind of fell away from that a little bit going to college. Everything interest was more what's on a computer screen than what's up in the sky. And then moved back over down here into this area and went to astronomy at the beach again. And this was now in, it would have been beginning of, it was 2018. I was like, this is what I want to be doing. This is great. I love stars and astronomy. Great. And so the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Interest in observing and. Uh... Yeah. I always wanted to take pictures because I'd see, every, like everyone else, just see the Hubble images and all oh, that looks awesome. See other people, images that even amateur astronomers were starting to be able to take at that point and just showing nebula and everything. It's like, this is really cool. I want to learn how to do that. So you don't need an observatory to do that. So why build one? Uh, to have an observatory, you're able to have stuff set up permanently. So you don't need to break it down all the time. If you have inclement weather come in, especially being in Michigan, we have all of a sudden you wake up and you got a foot of snow and if you have a telescope set up out there, now it's covered in snow, it doesn't work too well with optics or electronics. Uh, that, that's true. So um, when did you first decide that you uh, wanted to, needed to build an observatory? Uh, well, I had my first setup was back in 2019. And I had my setup here. And I would say modest, but still uh, it's a very good mount the EQ6R and an Esprit 100 which is a triplet APO so both really really good for astrophotography purposes but a run-of-the-mill Canon DSLR that I was using so it was a great setup to start with even though I was living in Canton at the time with a lot of light pollution so my wife and I, we were looking at a new house. Where, where do we want to go to live? And I was one of my requirements was, I want to be able to build an observatory. Sure, I didn't mind setting up the telescope all the time, but just being able to have a place that's set up permanently and be able to go, hey, I want, it's clear tonight. It's ready to go. I don't need to spend an hour getting it set up, getting polar aligned. Exactly, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, that was one of the uh, considerations. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was definitely a consideration was, hey, if I'm able to be set up, ready to go, especially now that I have an almost three-year-old, I can just say, hey, let's, it's clear tonight, I'm ready to go, so I don't need to spend all that time or worry about him when I'm getting stuff set up. Exactly. Yeah. Very curious three-year-old. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> with, within my, all my research on everything, I was, I found, uh, plans from Skyshed. Okay. And they gave me a breakdown of all the different sizes of different observatories. And so I picked a 10 by 12 for my area. I can have up to 120 square foot shed and I don't need to submit plans or anything. So 10 by 12 is a perfect size, fits right inside of that. There you go. So I found these plans and kind of used them as a guideline more or less. It goes, okay, this is how they did it. And I built it with my dad. I would advise if anyone wants to build an observatory, get more than help from a mid seventies father. To help you, and especially not during the winter. Well, yes, yes. It, uh, uh, so we 
we looked at it. He has a bunch of handyman experience. So we just went through and, okay, this is what we need to do and kind of adapted it to our own means. Okay, so you didn't have any uh, code restrictions or requirements, well, that you had to stay within. Correct, correct. So. I didn't need to submit plans to my township or anything, which definitely was nice. Yeah. However, I kind of kept with what would be the best building would last the longest. So I hired a concrete company to come in. They dug the fo form work and everything for me. So they, I had them do a two foot rat wall around it. I had them dig four foot piers for each of my peers that are going in there because that's what would last the longest. So I had them come in. I didn't want to deal with digging all that out, leveling it off, pouring the concrete slab. And when they did come in to pour the concrete slab, I had two forms that I handed them with the anchor bolts for okay. them already. And I said, this is the measurements that I want them from the sides. And so they just went out and put them in there just all, so they were all ready to go. And this was put in uh, end of October, 2021, it was okay. put in. So then I had to wait for concrete to cure and everything sure. before I could build anything on it. Okay. And so I waited until just after Thanksgiving. So it was the day after, it was Friday after Thanksgiving 2021, my dad and I got together, we started cutting lumber and we got the framing put up. Great. Within within that weekend, we had the framing put up, and then I think within that next week, we had put siding. Okay. Up, and so it was it was taking shape. So you you made pretty good progress once the concrete yeah. had enough time to sufficiently cure to. Yeah, and then as soon as it was cured, it was off to the races basically. Right to get it up and uh, try to get. Uh, get it covered, right? Yeah, yeah, it's because as soon as we got the walls up and then it's okay, when's the next clear day? When's it nice enough? And as you can see in this image, it, it was running into the dark. It, the sun had set by the time we had the siding all up and we got the roof, the, at least the frame of the roof set. And so we had, there's a V track up there on the supports. So we'd rolled the roof out back and forth I noticed on the uh, supports for the, the rails when the roof comes over, um, are those poles set in concrete as well? No, those ones are just set in uh, pier biscuits, basically, with a little jack stand. So then I can, any freeze or thaw, ground heave, I can adjust them to keep the, the supports level. Oh okay, yeah, that would be a problem unless you dug a four-foot hole, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I didn't. The frost line. I didn't necessarily need to do that okay, with doing it, this. It just had to be level when you were going to actuate the roof. Correct. Yeah. And then it was quickly after that. It was just get the more siding on, get the roof up there because I wanted to go. We were we we're getting close to at least a beginning finish line, right? Getting it. I'd, I'll say weather tight, but if the roof's closed, it's not going to be raining or snowing inside. Right. So we got the plywood up for the roof, and then we, I went to Menards, and we got a metal roof to put up on it instead of going with shingles or anything else. All right. Just my dad and I were able to handle these. They're three-foot-wide sections by a little, about six and a half feet long. Okay. And there's, so there's four on each side, and we just put it up there, get them set, and screw it all down. It was Pretty easy. Yeah, we did we did the whole roof in an afternoon really? between the two of us. Okay. Well, yeah, you've got two sets of hands, putting them up there. Yep. And then well, he up. was he was up on the roof, and I would hand it up there and slide oh, it up. Oh, you had to him. Uh, dear old dad up. Yeah, there. he's like, I'm going up there. So, okay, have fun. <laughs> I'll stay down here. I'll go walk and get you the stuff. Thanks. Dad. And then as soon as we got it open, or we got the metal roof all on, slid it open, saying, Hey. We're able to, we're able to have it open. I can push it by hand, by myself. I could push it open and close. Oh, it, it rolls that easily. Yeah, it rolls pretty. Getting over the inertia of it a little bit, well, it takes sure. a little bit to start. But yeah, as soon as it starts rolling, I just lean on it, and it's able to roll just all by itself until it gets to its stops. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. I have some. I have a couple positive stops on it, so I won't accidentally just roll it right off the end. Yeah. That 
Not a good idea. No, no. But. <laughs> uh, quick question for the observatory. Uh, the direction that the roof rolls off, what direction is that? That rolls to the east. Oh, to the east. My house is on the east side as well. Okay. So I just roll it towards the house because, because the house is just blocking it blocking all. Blocking anyway. anyways, and you don't want to image directly over the house because you have thermal currents. Okay. Yeah, that would. Yeah. Yeah. So you <laughs> just image that way. So, but then now that I had it all covered up and everything, I get the pier in there, put sand inside of it because otherwise it's just a big metal tube. And as soon as I started putting that sand in it, as I was tightening it up, making sure it was level. I'm hitting it with a ratchet and it's just bang and it's just radiating and I put start putting that sand in it and then it was just a dull thunk when I hit it with the metal really? so it's definitely doing its job okay but get the sand in there get the mount put on top of it so it's ready to go and then I'm just yes we we had wiring was done too I oh okay the, yeah yes another company I hired they did my they did my uh, main panel in the house but I also had them run Ethernet and power out to the observatory so everything is out there so I can and is all that back. underground it's all yeah it's all buried underground a couple feet down okay and then I did all the wiring from the breaker side out into the observatory so both Ethernet and power to a bunch of different outlets out there and get it all powered up. And this was all happened over the course of the day. The contractor came out there, they dug, they put the breakers in, I finished wiring, got the mount set up, got the telescope on it, and was able to get first light that night. That had to be a great night. It was, it was. <laughs> yeah. Being able to go out there, and it was February 21st, I was able to get out there, open the roof up, and be able to image for that first night. And I know in uh, the second segment, we're going to talk about some of the improvements for automation. So yes. we're going to take a, uh, a quick break. Uh, if you have a question, as always, please send us an email, which you can see across the bottom of your screen. And coming up next with Term of the Month is Stephen. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is Psyche. Psyche, 16 Psyche, is a 220 kilometer uh, diameter, that's a 141 mile diameter iron nickel asteroid in the Mars Jupiter belt. It could be the interior of a planetesimal, though other origins have been proposed. It spins on its side like Uranus with a 98 degree axial tilt. The European Southern Observatory, VLT, imaged it in 2019. NASA is launching a probe on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket on October 5th. That's this month, um, that's October, this next month. There is a Mars flyby in 2020, uh, 2026. The Psyche probe is expected to arrive at Psyche in 2029 and orbit for four years. The science objectives are to determine whether Psyche is a core or if it's unmelted material, measure the relative ages of regions on Psyche's surface, measure light elements for comparison to the Earth's high-pressure core, determine Psyche's formation conditions, and finally, characterize Psyche's topography. And that is Term of the Month, Psyche. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. We're here in the studio talking with team member Sean Pickard about the construction of his home observatory. So, Sean, um, can you talk a little bit about the improvements that you were planning to make and, and have made to uh, improve the automation? Yeah. Uh, my vision when I first set out was I want to be able to say, essentially say, go, I want this data, and the observatory just goes and handles it. Well, in order to get there from where we just saw last, is I need to install a roof motor so that it is able to open and close the roof by itself. And so it was just a simple gate motor. You've seen them at lots of storage facilities with just like a rack and a pinion basically. Sure, sure. And it's all, at least at this point, it was just remote controlled with a little remote that has, and we I know we have a video, 
of that running. just a simple, I press the button, it runs out, there's a couple magnetic switches that are on either side. So one side says, okay, it's all the way open. I click the button again, and the roof goes and closes, just essentially all by itself. So you don't have to get out there and overcome the inertia? Correct. So now I never needed to go outside to click a button, because I can just click the button to open the roof. But the downside is if I don't go outside, I don't know exactly if it's clear yet, so I installed an all-sky camera. It's just mounted on the side of the roof. It's essentially a little tiny camera. It's run by a Raspberry Pi. It's pointed up at the sky, and I'm able to see the sky from that location. And you can, in this one image, you can see the Milky Way. So it's the camera is sensitive enough that it can pick up the Milky Way. It can pick up satellites. There's Tiangongs actually passing just at the bottom of the frame there. And so I can now look at that and see if there's clouds or anything. So I can tell it to open or close because I haven't automated it further than that. The next step was adding a sky alert, which is just a little weather station safety monitor. So it has a thermal camera in there so it can sense if there's clouds, if it's raining, and then alert the computer say, hey, it's not safe. And so I can get the telescopes parked because if it's cloudy, it's not worth imaging. Sure, sure. But you need a way for the computer to talk to the roof. So that's the uh, sky roof is now. It's a little control panel. The brains of the motor are a little bit different. I can't control it by a remote control anymore, but I can log into a computer and tell the computer, hey, open the roof and the roof will open up by itself. So now I'm effectively fully autonomous. In this video, I pressed play on my two computers. I went to sleep. The roof opened up all by itself. The telescopes went off, started imaging. It imaged through the night, or at least the first couple hours of the night, got to the meridian, the scopes did a meridian flip. Everything all by computer. There is no input by me. At one point during the night, the, the sky alert noticed, hey, there's clouds moving through. So the telescopes will park, the roof will close up. Now I have another plug-in that will tell the, the sequence, hey, it's not safe. We're going to wait until it's safe. It'll wait for five minutes after the sky alert tells it it's safe again. It'll open the roof and start imaging again. So everything is really completely autonomous. It is. It's completely autonomous from beginning of the night, and then I wake up in the morning, everything's closed up. You check your data? I check the data. Okay, we're good. We, have, we got things captured. Things were good. Any errors that popped up during the night, I could be alerted. I could have it turned on where it'll alert me. During the middle of the night, I'll send an alarm to my phone and say, hey, something went wrong, and then I can log in and fix it. Okay. But I had uh, a bunch of images that I'd like to show that okay. I've captured from my observatory since I built it. Are there any uh, future improvements that you'd like to put in on this uh, before we take a look at those images? Future improvements would be, uh, I don't really have a way that the roof is held down right now. Right now it's just V-Track with a grooved wheel sitting on top of it. There are, I have seen products out there that it's more of like uh, two wheels in a slotted track or kind of think of like a garage door almost. Sure, Except okay. this one is made for roll-off roofs where it sits on top and at least holds it down. In high way. winds, your roof isn't... Exactly. Yeah. As it is right now, if there's a high wind situation, such as a severe thunderstorm, tornado warning, I actually have to go out there and I have a couple turnbuckles that I'll go and tighten the roof down, then okay, we're good. I can go back out there and, um, and take them back off again. But I'd like to even eliminate that step. Okay. Where Especially the, if something happens while you're at work? While, while I'm right. working yeah. or I'm here at the studio and I didn't see that there was going to be a weather event happening. Interesting. Interesting. Well, let's take a look at some of these images. Yeah. So the first one that I brought is the Crescent Nebula. 
And, and all of these is, are about, probably about 30 hours that I put into each one. So decent amount of time, but if you have a permanent setup, it's not that difficult. It's exactly. You just as opposed to setting up and tearing down. Every slowly night. capture, and then I'm able to just keep getting more and more data. We have the Soul Nebula, is another one. Uh, this next one is kind of interesting. It's, some people see a skull. I'll see. Uh, it's called the the cosmic question mark. So it looks like a it does. The way it, Yes. The setup looks like a big question mark. You can mark. see it either way, the question mark, the skull. But yeah, sure, 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 sure. And then we have the Dumbbell Nebula, which is really, it's a, it's a famous one. A lot of people have seen it. Sure. You can see it visually, obviously not in colors, but you also have the, the wings of it, which are faint O3 signals in there. And then the last one is the latest one that I finished, which is the Eagle Nebula, which has in the middle of it is the, the Pillars of Creation. Oh, yes. Which are the, yeah. the famous from Hubble. I have all those images and other ones that I've captured from my observatory. They're all up on my website if you wanted to ever go take a look at them. So folks could see your work that you've been able to, to do with the uh, observatory in your backyard. Yeah, and then keep up with any of the, my new work and things like that. And I think the socials are on the website too, so you could find me that way too. All right, great. Uh, in the time that we have left, I, I did want to ask you, in, in looking at those images, what type of image processing do you use? I use a program called PixInsight. So it'll, PixInsight's rather robust. It's made for astrophotography. A lot of people will use Photoshop or other free alternatives. And I found that PixInsight has the best tools for what I want to do. Is that a do. subscription, Pixins? It was or a, a one-time fee. Oh, okay. It, it was a one-time fee, so a lot better than what Adobe wants you on the hook for with Photoshop. Okay. But yeah, it was a one-time fee, and then it's definitely, you get a book thrown at you, and you have a steep learning curve, but then kind of figure out what works for you, what doesn't, and... I've built up a process tree that I work through and most of the time is spent just run this run this process and now wait. Okay, that process is done. Run the next one. Okay, wait. Okay, it's done. And then there's a point where I get to nonlinear data, which is I've stretched the image because a lot of times the image is just black with a few dots on it. Now I stretch the image and now I start working with the colors and bringing out different parts of the nebula. And that's the more artistic side of it, where it takes a lot longer and it's not so much just letting the computer crunch numbers. Okay. Uh, when you do take the, uh, the images, do you take them in separate color filters or? I do. I shoot in monocolored. And I have a monochrome camera. Okay. All my, my two main cameras are monochrome cameras. So I'll shoot in RGB. My stars and all my images that I have right now, I'll be in RGB at least because your S, S which is sulfur 2, oxygen 3, hydrogen alpha, the stars kind of look funny. They don't look natural because our eyes don't see in those wavelengths. So I'll shoot, if I'm shooting a narrow band such as the Eagle Nebula that we showed earlier, was shot in narrow band of SHO, which is also known as the Hubble palette. Okay. All right. So it looks like if we could see, like what the image shows us, that would be what it would look like to us. Yeah. And then I take out all the stars off of that, off of the SHO image, and I bring in my RGB stars. So it's a more natural color for the stars. So if you were to look at it through a telescope at that, you might see some of that star color a little bit. Oh, okay. Really sounds uh, quite the art in yes, addition yes. to the science. John, I would like to thank you for coming on the show and uh, telling everyone all about uh, your observatory and, and the process that you use and sharing some of your images. Sean, I'd like to thank you for being on the program today to tell us all about your uh, observatory at home and talk about you know how you capture your images. It's great to be here. 
You're very welcome. Um, please check the club website. Uh, the address, of course, is at the bottom of your screen. And coming up to finish out the program, as always, is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. What's Up in the Night Sky for September 2023? The autumnal equinox is on the 23rd of September and after that the days get shorter or longer uh, slower as we head toward the solstice. Now September starts with a nearly full moon because August 27th was in fact a full moon. So the last quarter is on the 6th, the new moon is on the 14th, the first quarter is on the 22nd and we end with a full moon on the 29th. Uh, Mercury and Venus are shown here on the 22nd of September uh, in the morning just before sunrise. Mercury is in Leo and sets just after sunset. Mercury, that's at the beginning of the month. Mercury has inferior conjunction on September 6th. Um, and so at the end of the month, Mercury rises um, an hour and a half before sunrise. But it is shown here on the 22nd because maximum western elongation is on the 22nd and Mercury is 17.9 degrees away from the Sun, which is fairly far, but it would be a lot farther away from uh, the Sun if perihelion wasn't on the 23rd. That's when Mercury is physically closest to the Sun. Venus is, goes from Cancer to Leo over the month and rises two hours before sunrise to an hour and a half before sunrise, so it's better at the beginning of the month. Mars is shown here on the first for no, re no apparent reason, uh, and this is just after sunset. Mars is in Virgo all month and sets from an hour after sunset to half an hour after sunset, so it's a little better at the beginning of the month. Uh, superior junction is so superior conjunction um, is coming up November 18th. That's when Mars goes behind the sun. Then we have Uranus, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, Pluto on the 15th for no apparent reason, and it's a few hours after uh, sunset. Uh, Uranus is in Aries, rises. Uh, an hour and a half after sunset to an hour after sunset. It's heading toward opposition on November 13th. Uh, Jupiter is also in Aries, rises uh, two and a half hours after sunset to an hour and a half after sunset. It's heading to opposition November 3rd. Neptune is in Pisces, and since it has opposition on September 19th, it is up basically all night in, in September. Saturn is in Aquarius and is essentially up all night at the beginning of the month because August 27th it heads opposition. Uh, at the end of the month it sets approximately two hours uh, before sunrise. Pluto is in Sagittarius and sets four hours from four hours after sunrise to uh, six hours uh, before sunrise. Um, and that is what's up in the night sky for September 2023. Uh, remember, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain.